welcome to another edition of What on Earth? Your news in a nutshell. While the President of the United States pretty much hogged the headlines this week, a lot of other things played out in the background through this period. On October 6th, the Trump administration ordered American troops to withdraw from northeastern Syria, where the United States had been supporting its Kurdish allies. This was a virtual green light to Erdogan's Turkish administration to annex a portion of Syria and displace the Kurdish population living there. Their military operations started on October 9th when the Turkish Air Force launched airstrikes on border towns followed by Turkish forces invading Syria. Turkey aims to create a buffer zone between Turkey and Syria, which will enable Erdogan to expel the 3 million Syrian refugees living in Turkey. While this action has resulted in almost 100 deaths and more than 300,000 civilians, mainly Kurds, being displaced, what is worrying is the possible resurgence of ISIS. Vice President Pence traveled to Turkey to try and negotiate a ceasefire a task that was made even more difficult thanks to a petulant letter written by Trump to Erdogan. The ceasefire was agreed on, but the fighting continues. An impeachment inquiry against Donald Trump was initiated on September 24th by Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. This was the result of a whistleblower report alleging that President Donald Trump and his administration officials had pressured leaders of foreign nations which is an abuse of his power to advance his personal interests. A rough transcript of a July call between President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine revealed that the U.S. president had urged the Ukrainian president to investigate former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden, who is the frontrunner to take on Mr. Trump in next year's election, as well as Mr. Biden's son. The call came shortly after Mr. Trump had personally blocked releasing millions in military aid to Ukraine. UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson managed to squeeze out a withdrawal agreement with the EU, but faced a dramatic reverse in his own parliament as MPs voted to withhold approval for the deal. This means that Bojo is probably left with one more attempt in parliament before formally asking the EU to delay Brexit. In case things don't go his way, October 31st could see a no-deal Brexit happen. Mexican security forces captured drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's son from a house in the Mexican city of Culiacan. But his stay in custody was more like a short tete-a-tete -tete as security forces came under intense fire from the drug cartel's gunmen. Battles raged on the streets for more than 10 hours as soldiers were taken hostage and the city work was paralyzed. More than 8 civilians were reported killed and 16 injured, causing the NYT to term it as a badly scripted Netflix show. In the end, Mexican forces retreated and Ovidio Guzman remained in the company of his friends. This botched operation shows that El Chapo's kids have taken over the mantle of the Sinaloa cartel and the Mexican government just blinked. The Nobel Peace Prize 2019 was awarded to President Abiy Ahmed Ali of Ethiopia, mainly for his decisive initiative to resolve the border conflict with neighboring Eritrea. That might have left a bunch of other illustrious people who were rumored to be in the running for the prize in various states of mind. The Booker Prize was awarded jointly to Margaret Atwood for The Testaments and Bernardine Evaristo for Girl, Woman, Other. This was the first time the prize was shared since 1992, despite a rule change banning joint winners. The Nobel Memorial Prize for Economics was shared by MIT economics professor Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo and Harvard economist Michael Kramer for their work on anti-poverty research. Esther Duflo, at 46, is the youngest person to win this award and she and Abhijit Banerjee are also married to each other. Like every year, there was a fair share of arguments about the prize for economics being a true Nobel Prize. But, of course, what's the fun in awards without a little bit of controversy, right? Speaking of controversies, Conrad and his team landed the best teamwork prize at the annual inter-school STEM competition at their school in Hong Kong. Congratulations to the other teams that came in first, second and third. 
the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2019 passed the U.S. House of Representatives. Simply put, this act makes the original United States Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992 conditional and would end the Hong Kong U.S. special trading status unless the U.S. State Department is able to annually certify that Hong Kong's administrators are respecting human rights and the rule of law. The bill is still far from becoming law, though. It needs to go through the Senate and the President. And that last roadblock is what will be the toughest to achieve. Why? Because President Donald Trump and Xi Jinping are tighter than Calvin Klein underwear. So everything ultimately depends on which side of the bed Mr. Trump wakes up on. And now on to our main story. For a very long time, the biggest influencers have been countries in the West, with maybe the odd exceptions being Japan and Switzerland. The ability to attract and co-op rather than coerce has, begin, has been important in spreading culture, social and political values, and even foreign policies. This also results in countries gaining respect and economic power over time. Joseph Nye of Harvard University explained that with soft power. The best propaganda is not propaganda. But last week saw possibly what the future of influence is going to look like. The future looks like hard power, and this was on full glorious display as multiple individuals and companies came up against the great wall of Chinese social media and had to backtrack positions that they held in the face of concerted pushback. In my opinion, the biggest reason for this change is the way the previously most influential nation in the world has decided to carry forward its engagement. So, what exactly happened? Ng Wai Chung, also known as Blitz Chung, is a Hong Kong-based gamer who recently won the World Hearthstone Gaming Championships. Upon winning, he pulled out a gas mask on his live stream and said, Liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our age. And with that statement, the gaming world changed. Blizzard Games, the owner of the Hearthstone, immediately banned Blitzchung from their platform and stripped him of his $10,000 prize money. Everyone, including Blizzard's employees, knew that this had been done with the aim of minimizing any offense that might have been caused to Chinese gamers and maybe even the Chinese government as a whole. Daniel Mori the general manager of the Houston Rockets had a bit of a rough day on Twitter when he tweeted his support for Hong Kong and its protesters and then immediately removed it when he realized how much the NBA has come to rely on China. Calls for his sacking from Chinese social media grew to a crescendo. The Chinese government also decided to step in and block the airing of NBA games because of this. Apple, DreamWorks, Tiffany, Versace and Coach are just some of the soft power representatives of their countries who have been forced to issue apologies to China and its people and also make corrections or withdraw content that was deemed to hurt the feelings of the Chinese. Now, whether it was in the form of an app that enabled protesters to track the movement of the police in Hong Kong or a map that didn't explicitly state that Taiwan was a part of China, the outpouring of angst from Chinese netizens was amplified by the support of the Chinese government, state media, and even from Chinese consulates in different parts of the world. China now has pretty much everyone looking over their shoulders while they say anything about anything that has even the remotest of links to China. And here's why. China is the world's biggest market and everyone is afraid of losing access to the riches that this market promises. If someone makes a statement deemed hurtful to the Chinese in any way, they are going to be forced to issue heartfelt apologies and kowtow, maybe even be punished. This is essentially cancel culture. Individuals, companies and even countries who have shared a questionable or unpopular opinion that hurts the feelings of the Chinese people because it is perceived to be offensive or problematic are now called out on social media. They are cancelled, completely boycotted by their followers or supporters, often leading to massive declines in their fortunes. The NBA had one of its representatives say something that the Chinese didn't like, 
criticism of it went viral, people boycotted it, the Chinese government amplified it, and then there's nothing else to do but to beg for forgiveness if they want to continue to do business in China. China has so much power over this that there isn't any discourse behind the cancel. So now, in order to avoid angering or upsetting China, everyone needs to self-censor. It's either that or bye-bye Chinese market. Essentially, companies and corporations now have their mind completely fixated on money. And China is the jackpot. Many countries, the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, and Sweden, have all faced politically motivated Chinese commercial and trade embargoes, and virtually all multinationals are now under pressure to change the way that they acknowledge Taiwan, Macau, and Hong Kong on their materials, websites, and even packaging, to ensure that these places are not even remotely confused as independent entities. China has banned performers even, including Katy Perry, Oasis, and our good old friend Biebs, among others, for their support of greater freedoms in Taiwan and Tibet. While a number of countries and individuals have refused to back down in the face of Beijing's threats, last week showed that most companies now prefer to comply in order to preserve access to the Chinese market. This was probably a defining moment. The shift from a soft power-based influence gathering world to a harder market power respecting one just means that the price we will all pay is likely to get much higher. That's all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to What on Earth. I'll see you next week. My name is Markandeya Karthik and this is your news in a nutshell.